So it's been nearly one and a half years since I began my journey into the realms of computer science. And since then, I've developed my own iOS game. I've written a physics collision engine entirely from scratch. But nothing's quite made me love the subject like genetic algorithms. There's something intriguing about combining biological phenomenon with computer science, something so fluid with something so mechanical that makes this so fascinating. Before I dig deeper into the implementation of genetic algorithms into computer science, let me take you through a short biology lesson. So every organism is made up of a set of blueprints that determine how it acts and how it looks. Now these blueprints are encoded into the genes of the organism. The genes, in turn, are strung together as chromosomes. When two organisms mate, they share these genes, and the resultant offspring may end up having some genes from one parent and some genes from the other. This process is called recombination. Very occasionally, a gene of the offspring may be mutated and result in the formation of an entirely new trait. To better understand these concepts, let me tell you a small story. Let's consider a hypothetical species called hooters. Now, these hooters live in dark cave systems. They are totally blind, as they don't need eyesight in the darkness. They have an easy life. They eat their algae, listen to the hoots of other hooters, and aren't worried about any predators. However, one day, a massive earthquake ruptured the cave system and exposed them to sunlight for the first time ever. Along with this, they were exposed to grasslands and moss. Well, this was quite great, as moss was far more delicious than algae, and the hooters ventured out and ate the moss. However, eagles from above swooped down and ate the hooters. The situation was rather grim indeed, and for a moment there, it looked as though the hooters would be driven into extinction. However, one day, a bunch of hooters were born that had a genetically mutated skin cell gene that led to the formation of light-sensitive skin cells on their forehead. They could now tell when anything was blocking the sunlight from reaching their forehead. So now these hooters ventured into the grasslands bravely as they could tell when eagles were above. This greatly improved their rate of survival and hence their rate of mating and their rate of reproducing. Soon, the entire population was dominated by hooters with this slight advantage. Hence, here you can see how the processes of natural selection, survival of the fittest, and genetic mutations are important for the survival of a species. Now let me tell you a bit about the algorithm. There are five basic steps to the algorithm. First, you initialize a population of chromosomes that are randomly generated. Then, you assign a fitness score to each chromosome based on its ability to solve the given problem at hand. After that, we select two members favoring the fittest ones. Next, we recombine their genes of, two, of the two selected parents by crossing over their chromosomes at a randomly selected point. Then, I apply a mutation to the offspring's genes based on a mutation rate. Now, this mutation rate is obviously very low as the chance of mutations are really low. Finally, you repeat this process until you have an entirely new population with a slightly better advantage at solving the given problem. Now, I come to the traveling salesman problem. There's a really famous and extremely complicated problem in theoretical computer science called the traveling salesman problem. The aim of this problem is to find the shortest possible route between a number of given destinations. Now, the most obvious approach to this problem would be to take the brute force approach, which is basically to calculate each possible permutation of every route that you can take. Now, this is a rather good algorithm for, small for, for a small number of destinations, as the total number of calculations required is given by the number of destinations factorial. For anyone who doesn't know what a factorial is, it's simply the number multiplied by its preceding number, so on until 1. So 4 factorial is 4 into 3 into 2 into 1. So for a number of destinations like 4, this number comes out to be 24, and that's rather simple. However, 
When that number becomes 24, 24 factorial is somewhere close to 626 trillion, which is an extremely large amount. And hence, you can see that brute force would be extremely inefficient and extremely time consuming in calculating the output. So as you can see on the screen, I'm going to have to ask my friend to fast forward towards eight minutes, because that's how long it took for the brute force algorithm to generate an output. Eight minutes for just 10 destinations. And this is where genetic algorithms step in. Now, you can see that my genetic algorithm will efficiently generate an output in a matter of seconds for 12 destinations. So now you see how these algorithms possess such immense power. And it's simply so fascinating to see this combination of biology and computer science to produce such a phenomenal result. And now onto my main event. So one day, I was experimenting with the combination of genetic algorithms and neural networks. And I wrote a program which involved a world of scattered coins and self-evolving cars with a single mission imprinted onto their neural networks to collect more coins. Out of the 100 billion neurons in a human brain, I had mimicked the functionality of me or 10 of them. And now, as you can see, when I first started this program at generation zero, the cars were wandering around aimlessly, not knowing how to make sense of this dark, frightening world, this foreign land that I had spawned them into. They had no clue where to go or what to do. It was only what I saw the next morning, roughly 300 generations later, that truly blew my mind. After 300 generations, as you can see, these cars were blazing through the map, rapidly picking up the coins, almost racing one another so they could get the coins quicker. This was truly unlike anything I had ever seen before. After this, I began to question, what exactly does an entity have to possess to be considered living? Were these cars not left entirely on their own in this dark world, not knowing what to do? Yet somehow, they had made sense of it. They had learned on their own, left to their own accord, to perform a simple function. This got me thinking. And in this moment, I looked beyond the hundreds of lines of code I had written and gazed into the simmering potential this had for our future. Artificially intelligent beings capable of learning. Robots, yet somehow so very human. Thank you. <laughs>